what the heck is a crawl space and why wouldn't you make it a standing up space instead? It, wouldn't that be easier to work on? That's hilarious, right? Out of the standing up space. <laughs> it sure freaking would. There's <laughs> disgusting crawl space. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, a weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm senior editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building technical editor Mark Peterson. Hi there. Woo, he's back. <laughs> Fine Home Building executive editor Samantha Maver. Hi. And Fine Home Building senior producer Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it is a pleasure to see you all this morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Happy Mark Thursday. Been... Oh, wait. Um, what day are, do you listen to it on? It's Friday. Always. Happy Friday. <laughs> it's always Friday. I just, I just want everyone to have a secret sauce is made. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, it's been ages since you've been on the show. You've had a number of life changes, and we're going to dedicate the after show topic to the construction of your new home, which looks like you are living in. Is that true? I'm not. I'm no longer in a barn. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, your marriage also survived the construction of the house, I understand. <laughs> I'm married to the best woman in the world because I don't think too many other people would have put up with that. <laughs> So we'll talk about it more, of course, in the after show, but what is the best part of your new house? Just the space. I mean, just nice to have space. I mean, you really, well, and I'll, without going on a long tangent, it, living in that barn, in a cramped little barn, it was amazing what you can get by with and what you can put up with. And, you know, I had one tenth of what I have in here and it's like, you know what, do I need all of the other stuff? And you really don't. <laughs> but then when you have the space, Eh, you get right back into what you, <laughs> the way you, you were doing it before. So did you have enough stuff to furnish your house when you were done? And were you living with all that in the barn? I was, no, we had a storage. I, I bought one of those uh, storage, you, uh, like a 40, you know, tr uh, shipping container. Uh -huh. so all my stuff was on property in a shipping container. But no, I had, I had, we had, I mean, we are, we had a chair. I mean, we had, she had a chair and I had a chair and that's, if we were going to watch TV or something that was, we'd have to like move them out of the corner and drag them into the middle, <laughs> put them next to each other. If you want to be on a couch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure yeah. you missed that. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> so how much longer were you in the barn than you had planned to be, uh, or at least in the beginning planned to be? So I first moved, you know, I was living in a travel trailer. And so actually the barn was, I mean, there's a brand new travel trailer. It was pretty, it was long. It was like 35 feet and it had a big pump, you know, pop out. Mm -hmm. So it was comfortable, but it's just so small. So that was like six months there. And then I think we were like eight months in that. And then, and she was actually living mostly in, at her sister's house in the closest town by nearby. But then we moved into that. So the barn door was actually an upgrade, but I think we were, we were there for about six months. And mm. that, that was kind of, that was probably a few months, two months longer than I thought it would be. That's not so bad. bad <laughs> but it's like right across the street. So it was, you know, and I was so busy. It really didn't, it's a, I slept there and that's all I did. So it wasn't that big of a deal. You've seen the money pit, I'm sure. So two weeks, just two weeks. <laughs> yeah, right. No, it was, yeah. Well, that's, uh, we can get into it afterwards. But three weeks down here is the kiss of death if you want contractors to show up. If they say three weeks, 100% of the time, that means they're not coming ever. Yeah, and you know what? I don't blame them because I know what goes on in their head. They're like, oh, I really want to do this. But this week, there's no way. Next week, no way. And in three weeks, their brain is saying, yeah, I think maybe. You know, things will be maybe. So yeah, three weeks is, I almost guarantee, no, it was a guarantee. Every time somebody said three weeks, it was Okay. I hope our done. I hope our listeners will write in with what their uh, kiss of death time frame is, because uh, <laughs> I'm guessing it varies with the community. Yeah, wow. I figure I'll call you right back means I'm never going to hear again. <laughs> <laughs> 
You, Samantha, uh, yesterday you mentioned you're going to try and fix your uh, holes in your plaster. Uh, yeah, is that is that a go? Have you bought some stuff yet? Tomorrow I was going to try. I haven't bought anything. Well, you, you can also mix uh, powdered joint compound in just about anything. I mentioned a Revere wear bowl because it's got a nice round shape and with a rubber spatula, it makes mixing easy and it clean up easy. Um, yeah, but, and know. I'm going to probably go for the drywall repair first, which is not that crack in the ceiling that we really heavily discussed. And so for that, I just think some, you you thought maybe like a fiber mesh tape would yeah. work. And since it's so high up and so small, no one's going to punch a hole right through it. So maybe it doesn't need a drywall patch itself. Folks on the, who listen to the podcast have heard me talk about this product before, but Fiber Fuse is a drywall tape that's uh, a non-woven um, fiber material, obviously. And uh, it's real thin and it makes patching easy because you don't have this big buildup of paper tape to cover. And uh, because I love the stuff. Because to put paper tape on, you'd need the compound first. And I can't put compound on a hole. I'd have to actually put something in there first. Well, you you know, it kind of, it'll span a reasonable sized hole, the tape will, but this is just easier to work with because you can, put the mud through the tape instead of building it up below and on top. It's, awesome. I, I just think it's a more user-friendly product. All right. Well, now Have you're you, holding me to it. I got to go for it. I listened well, to that. I listened to that. And you, the best advice that you gave was, I think the people that make the most mistakes when patching a big hole is they're using regular joint compound instead of setting compound. Yes. Because that it cracks, you know, in, and when the drywall guys first go, I mean, good guys, they first get into a house, they run around with setting compound and fill all the big, you know, the big holes. There's a process pre-filling, right? It's like you're, you're, you're making solid backing so the tape doesn't bubble. And it, I unless do you, think that yeah. the wrong choice of compound is what led to, I initially skim coated my ceiling, which has that sand effect. Um, and it, and it cracked that first round. And I, I really think it yeah. was because the, it wasn't the right type of compound, yeah. whether it was like all purpose or setting. So I took, I took that to heart and we'll use that the right type. And, it, and the second best advice you gave was don't overfill it because it's like sanding granite. <laughs> yeah, that's really important. I probably would have. So yeah, underfill it and then skim coat it with joint the joint compound you still have left over from the last one. It's a process, right? We it's not a one time deal. It's 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 a build up. Yeah, it's, and let's yeah. be clear, it's a four year old's room, so access. She's gonna have high standards though, because like, <laughs> well, she's insisted like my mom works at fine home building. When I'm done. <laughs> Jeff, you got projects around the house for the long weekend coming up? Um, I think I'm actually going to do my railing. Whoa. Okay. Well, I, huh? uh, you know, I mentioned I might come by for that and, uh, I might drive by and see how it's going and depending, <laughs> uh, right. if you're I want to look on your face and stop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's exciting. Are, are you looking forward to it, or is it a, a, a dread, dread type project? Um, it's you know, like, like as I've said before, it's like it's not wrong until it's done. So it's like while it's not done, I'm good. But <laughs> <laughs> is this a porch railing? Yeah, yeah. I, I've got uh, my deck railing, so it's about what's it made out of? Uh, well, it's cedar posts and cable rail. Okay, and... cable rail. That's what I wanted to know because. I was hoping it would be that because that look is so clean and sleek right now. Yeah. yeah. And Jeff has an amazing deck because it's elevated and it would be a shame to have uh, a you know busy balustrade obstructing his lovely view of the valley below. Okay. What's under your deck? Is it just elevated mm -hmm. over ground or is it is there an under Yeah, well, it, it's high off the ground. So it's like 10, 12 feet off the ground and so it, it's a walkout basement. So the basement door is underneath that and... But you're not trying to heavily you, protect that area from. No, that's helpful. And are you replacing it? Replacing it, or with it, a cable, or fixing the cable, or what are you doing? Uh, well, because I, I resurfaced the deck, um, and so and so basically, I mean, the, this structure is the existing structure. So I replaced with um, uh, composite decking, and so I need to just do. Rails that meet code, unlike the old rails, which were okay. so. Right now, there isn't cable. You're you're doing a cable. Yeah, right now there's nothing. That's, 
Yeah, that's a good choice. Did you already buy So you must have had it. You must have bought it. <laughs> nothing is a good choice or cable rail is a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like the nothing. It's very clean and simple. <laughs> it means the <Yeah>. railing. <laughs> well, my wife said just too, don't Jeff, invite like, stupid people over. That's all. Yeah, you, you can't yeah. have rowdy friends like I do if, yeah. if uh, you're not going to have a railing. You, you can't invite me over. I will fall right off that deck. <laughs> <laughs> it's Clutch Paradise. <laughs> I did cable in you know I did cable in my um, in my stairwell transition and the it's it, some of these codes that you hear these building codes you hear of it's like come on really it's that i mean they're just so extreme but uh, horizontal uh, horizontal any kind of horizontal day, decking but it, i'm actually a little surprised they even allow that because you put a toddler next to horizontal railings or uh, spindles or whatever and they're climbing i mean that's like a lot that's a jungle gym that they're, well, they're it, it, it wasn't permitted for a climb up. It wasn't permitted for a while. It's like it's been put back. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I, you're right. you know, I'm I'm sure it's not lobbying on the behalf of the cable rail industry. I don't know <laughs> oh, what no. would have had uh, no. the effect. Our co-creation doesn't happen that way. That's a really <laughs> interesting point, Mark. I've never taken my four-year-old somewhere where there was a cable rail, but the first thing she would do is climb as she climbs our vertical deck. Every time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Liam and would have too. You got to watch them, and I'm not saying it should be against code. I'm just a little surprised that it's allowed. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Well, Jeff's got no four year old, so he's good. Yeah. But you, you know, if you have guests, uh, you you got to keep an eye on them because <laughs> little kids love stairs generally, right? So if they they see the stairs, they're going upstairs. They're going to see the cable rail at the landing. Woo! Yeah. Jungle gym. We're back at the playground. I want to remind folks about the uh, Northeast Building Science Symposium, which is taking place June 20th and 21st at Two Roads Brewery in Stratford, Connecticut. Oh, I'm I'll so be excited. There. Sorry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, Samantha and I will both be there. Jeff might be there too, but I think you're on a shoot. Yeah. Uh, so I we, will be. Yeah, I'll, I'll be. Yeah. In the shop. Oh, man. So, um, Two Roads is yeah. great, and I'm so glad this is right in our neck of the woods. And uh, we have some great presenters lined up for this uh, for, for this building science symposium. We have Ben Bogey, Jack Bruton, Steve Basic, Ross Trithui, and Koto Ueno. Koto Ueno. And it uh, should be a good time. Uh, I hope you all will consider coming and uh, love to meet you. And if you do show up, please introduce yourself to any one of us, and uh, we'd love to talk to you. We're prospecting for uh, local authors, right, Samantha? Yes, and I'm lobbying for T-shirts. That's the more important point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> uh, so uh, once again, thanks to all of you who wrote into the podcast email box. And uh, the, the feedback and questions are great this week. And I'm super appreciative that you all do that because it really is what makes the show good. Um, this comes from our friend Andy Steele, FRS Builders. Uh, I have word, one word for Nicole on how to manage the drudgery of working on your own home beer. Obviously, that's not an option on the job site, but on your own home, have at it. <laughs> Did you go through a lot of beer building your house, Mark? How about after? I'll say I safely consumed it after the after the day was done. <laughs> I was going to say, how many beers before you know you really popped the code? No power tools involved. It's probably the same level as a DUI. Let's just say I got all my digits still. So. <laughs> Um, you can't drink beer because of the celiac disease. So what do you recommend for me, Andy? <laughs> well, I'm in Kentucky, so it's, bourbon is always a recommendation. Moonshine, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Corn alcohol. I can't see doing uh, some heavy construction with like a like a pink rosé. <laughs> 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 it has to be something whiskey. You put it in a beat-up tumbler, nobody would That's, Yeah. <laughs> Just put it in a gross <laughs> container and you'll fit right in. Yeah, I'll put it right in the eddy. <laughs> This is coffee. What are you talking about? This is actually water. <laughs> um, we heard from Evan Bach Wig, who's uh, part of All, uh, All Mold Pro, and he wrote in about our discussion uh, regarding uh, keeping craft alive while doing soul bashing work. Once again, in reference to the Nicole's needs, Nicole's email, uh, he says, "I enjoyed y'all's discussion about how to stay motivated when dredging through projects. I wanted to comment on your discussion about making an investment in a good respirator." The full face respirator with air supply is called a PAPR, 
powered air purifying respirator, if I recall correctly. As a mold assessment consultant, I have several respirators at my disposal that I have invested in over the years. I have a 3M half face with P100 particle filters that I commonly use during nasty inspections and a full face respirator from North that I use every time I'm in a crawl space. I cannot recommend highly enough the full face respirator with its impact resistant plastic face shield. I believe they also make an attachment that will hold your glasses in place inside the mask, which I also believe you discussed as part of the frustration in attic work. Another huge benefit is the wide variety of filters available. If you're cleaning out decomposing rats and squirrels from an attic, for example, or a crawl space, they make P100 particle filters that also handle organic vapor so you can't smell a thing. Finally, these things don't have to be a budget breaker. eBay often has open box versions of all of these respirators that can be found at half their retail price. The more I've learned about lung health and the effect of fibers and particulates on our bodies, the more I've become a proponent of wearing a respirator all the time during any remodel work. Hope this helps. Cheers, Evan Bachwig, All Mold Pro. Evan, that was fantastic. Thank you for the firsthand information about that. Yeah. Do you all see... Do you all see folks like doing highway cuts with a, you know, gas powered cutoff saw without wearing respirators like all the time? I never see any. I was like, what the heck is wrong with you people? I, yeah. And the ones he's talking about, those are the full, I mean, the, like the full head, right? I guess, those are yeah. The, those are the kind of the only ones that work if you have a really big bushy beard, aren't they? <laughs> what do you say, Jeff? Yeah, almost any beard. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I can get away with it with a goatee. But much beyond that. Well, and just the in effect, not even just the in inefficiency of it, it's a, a, how uncomfortable they are. You may recall when Matt Milham, our former editor, wrote an article about respirators. I forget exactly what it was called, but it has sort of an overview of all the different types that I think were mentioned in this letter. And I remember specifically the discussion of how and which ones could be used with a beard and what were the most beard friendly and how difficult right. this was. I think Matt had like some facial hair when shooting this. It's very interesting. Yeah. I wrote a similar article and the conclusion on just a typical face dust mask was none of them. They, none, of, none of them work, basically, if you have a big beard. Hmm. But I see it all the time, uh, Patrick. I, there was a guy, we were doing a house and the insulator showed up and there was a guy up blowing uh, fiberglass, fiberglass in the attic. No, nothing. He's up there. And if you've ever done that, you know, you can't even see your hand in front yeah. of your face sometimes. And when we, and I stopped, I actually stopped his operation. I said, dude, I've got extra masks that you can wear. They're rest, I mean, they're just the face, you know, the, the dust masks, but they're better than nothing. He's like, oh no. He said, this stuff isn't, this is the new stuff. It's not bad for you. He said it was, it's, uh, if it gets in your lungs, it was uh, water soluble. So it's not even bad. Glass fiber is water soluble. Yeah, that's interesting. Glass. Oh my I think, God. I, said, I don't think glass is water soluble. But yeah. Well, what's so. interesting to me is there's a lot of tools and accessories in the building industry that are really like geared toward men. And it's harder to find things that are like the smaller, the right fit for women. But it does seem like respirators seem to be made for people without facial hair, which is more often. Yeah. Male. That's very that's very interesting to me. <laughs> Why is uh, that to not? totally true? And and kids, uh, uh, you can you know get little respirators too because this stuff matters. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're doing it full time. I mean, not that you should ever breathe any of that stuff in at any time, but boy, day after day after day, you just <laughs> that can't be good for you. I'm nervous just turning on my air conditioning for the first time. The, in what's the year, blowing out of there out yeah. of the, i yeah. want to wear a respirator just for that day in the house. <laughs> uh this comes from adam fort smith northwest territories canada did you all hear that northwest Ter Ter territories canada um the reach of the fine home building podcast never ceases <laughs> to amaze me uh that's not a I province FHB <laughs> what's that that's not a province is it uh yeah <laughs> really far. Is that the farthest one? Uh, it's pretty close. I don't know. Uh, you know, they all yeah. go around the Arctic Circle, uh, or I think it's three uh, provinces uh, go around the Arctic Circle, but I don't know which is the furthest north. But I can tell you it's way up there. Um, I've got them all listed in Fine Humbledings special binder. Don't worry. Canadian provinces? Yep. I've got them all listed right in front of me. 
I'm not going to list them for you. I don't think that would be very interesting. Although our video producer, Colin, is currently in Nova Scotia, which is one of them doing yeah. shoot. Is it the, that's part of the Maritimes. Is it its own province, Nova Scotia, or is it yep. the Maritime? Yeah, okay. Part of its own. I'm showing my uh, ignorance of uh, Canadian geography here, but this is good. I thought there were five provinces, but there are more. There's eleven on this yeah. list. So that's <laughs> let's talk. Adam about writes those. in the Icelandic word for geothermal energy is actually new, not too hard for English speakers. Um, I'm not even going to attempt this. Jeff, do you mind helping me out? Your feet are <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Can you do that best again, please? Ac best accent ever. Your feet are The and word for, for those, G. Those who aren't watching, that was really Jeff uh, saying that. <laughs> 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 <That's been laughs> uh, the word for geothermal power is Javar. Uh, the, the letter F is pronounced similarly to TH in English. If you're ever visiting Iceland, I highly recommend checking out the power plant just outside of Reykjavik. He put the name of it. I wasn't going to attempt to say that either. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's very impressive and has a great interpretive center. I'm not sure there is a word for ground source heat pumps. Pretty much everyone heats their homes with radiators, which use hot water supplied by the local power plant or baseboard heaters as electricity. Uh, electricity is very cheap, so cheap that many of the Icelanders I know keep a window cracked open year round for fresh air. This may also be a holdover from when most people heated their homes and cooked their meals by burning peat moss, which would dramatically reduce the indoor air quality. To this day, most homes have a place outside where kids sleep because of this. Uh, at, attached is a short clip of me saying heat pump in Icelandic. Uh, I am a non-native speaker, but I think I can get pretty close with this word. Love the show and thanks for the excuse to procrastinate on my renovations for a bit. Adam, thank you, that is super awesome. All right, well, let's give him a list of words to translate. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazingly, that this, this is not the only email we got on the subject of Icelandic uh, words for heat pump. Um, this comes from uh, Cleaner, and I hope I said that right, Cleaner. Uh, he, he gave me a phonetic pronunciation, so uh, that was hugely helpful. Hello, and you I would have not in a million years got that without that. It's it doesn't look like that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Am I right, Mark? L-Y-N-U-R. <laughs> so that's clean. <laughs> oh, so I, I love the accent. <laughs> Hello, FHB crew. I'm writing to you from Reykjavik, Iceland. In 2020, when faced with the task of renovating a condo we had just purchased, as a 10-thumbed office worker who had never really swung a hammer before, I started looking for resources and how to proceed with the job. I stumbled upon the Fine Home Building podcast, while I find most of the discussion on the show doesn't really seem to apply to the Icelandic styles of building, we have horizontal rain 50% of the time and snow the rest, I found the extremely entertaining crew and interesting discussions too enjoyable to let go of. I embarked on the journey of gutting and renovating a condo, mostly by myself, learning by doing along the way, all the while having the support of the FHB crew in my ears through the blood, sweat, swearing, and tears. So when we talk about Icelandic words we want to know, I want the best swear words cleaner uh, in Icelandic because I want to be able to use those at any provocation without anyone knowing what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, he says, in episode 560, 565, you called for the Icelandic word for geothermal, and I may finally be of some assistance the word for geothermal is yarthiti. Uh, Jeff, do you want to uh, correct me on my pronunciation? Yarthiti. <laughs> I was close. That's close. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more time, Jeff, please. Yarthiti. Yarthiti. Yeah. Where hiti is pronounced like the tool brand hilti without the L or like hit with an I at the end. Attach that as an audio file for your reference. <laughs> a heat pump is a I have no idea. Uh, I'll have to I'll have you figure out the pronunciation for yourselves. <laughs> Thanks you for <laughs> thank you for keeping me sane with your lively discussions during the hundreds of hours gone into my renovation work. Uh, I have many fond memories toiling away on something with the crew in my ears. Uh, regards, cleaner. Uh, P.S. 
It can't have been all that bad working on the condo as I've now come in the possession of a cabin in the countryside that needs way more work than the condo. I must have caught some bug. PPS, what the heck is a crawl space and why wouldn't you make it a standing up space instead? It, wouldn't that be easier to work on? That's hilarious, right? <laughs> the standing up space. <laughs> it sure freaking would. But there's disgusting crawl space. Uh, Cleaner, uh, generally speaking, we, we tell folks to do a basement if you can. There, I mean, it's a cost savings associated with a crawl space, which just, is just like a little basement if you do it correctly. But as you suggest, it is a big pain to get around there. And Evan Bachwig will tell you that sometimes a crawl space is only deep enough to slide under a house when you inhale <laughs> and not when you exhale. Okay. Do you remember that, Jeff? I, I was yeah. like, that sounds like a horrible place. Yeah. You wrote but about crit, this, you know, spiders, you? spiders, yeah, spiders and critters always, there's plenty of room for them down there, though. <laughs> Did you, you do it about base? recently, Mark, how, you know, if you have a crawl space and you, and you want it to be a basement, there's just some certain, you know, code requirements that make it a basement that you can't, it can't be it, a basement that is a crawl space unless you have it, this, this area and yeah. you just might not have that height area and those clearances at all. Well, and it's, it's a common problem because. Uh, and I never thought of it. I was had, I was writing a story with uh, Glenn Matheson, and he's a he's our know the code expert. Mm -hmm. And never even occurred to me, but you know, a crawl space like my crawl space, for example, has a six, maybe a six foot three inch clearance in part of it. It's at two different levels. So, you know, it, when you get to that area era where it's that big of a tall of a space, it's still a crawl space. But when you start finishing you know, putting drywall on or finishing flooring in an area like that, the the inspectors are going to frown on that, which I thought was odd. But the reason is, is the next homeowner could end up using that space as a spare bedroom or a living space. Well, crawl space, you don't have to have the safety features that you would in living, you know, like GFCIs I, and certain lighting codes. So egress and stuff like that. Yeah. There are certain conversations you have to have before you build or before you change anything to where it's like, all right, I got the six foot five space and we're calling it the crawl, crawl space, but I'm not doing any of the extra things that you would have to do in a living space. And inspectors, you know, you want to have that conversation before you do that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was issue 316. That never good all I mean, about. And, it's, and it's things like fire blocking and, you know, the protecting the, the other fire protection you need to some of those uh, engineered trusses and joists. I yeah. never even thought about it. So lower it seems a little spaces. It seems a little arbitrary to me. Like, uh, you know, six inches a foot difference between how deep it is and all of a sudden now you have to like drywall the ceiling. Uh, it, it's like, that doesn't seem right. Well, but that's the thing. They're saying you can't <laughs> drywall the ceiling, mm. you know, because they don't but want the future. Yeah. That'd be safer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's that. Don't get me started. <laughs> I was doing pretty well until just now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be safer for you, but not for the next person who moves in and doesn't realize that that's actually not a habitable space. Yeah, and th there's history of people doing that, right? And the college students or, um, you know, uh, first generation immigrants, all kinds of people who are, uh, you know, desperate for housing and have right. little money. Yes. Yep. Yeah. There's some explanation in there for why that I think is helpful. Well, um, we'll put a link to that, right, Samantha, in the yeah. in the show notes. Um, our first question, it's it's a long one, folks, so uh, uh, brace for it. It's this comes from Mark, dear Fine Home Building Podcast crew and esteemed listeners. We need your help. Buckle up, this is a long one. We purchased a, a 1970s mid-century bungalow in Ottawa, Ontario, in 2019. The home has a central clear story section with 15 foot high ceilings covered by a hipped roof. On either side of the central section are eight foot high wings with flat roofs. We fell for the architecture when we bought the house, but sadly have come to learn that many of these charming design details probably don't make sense in our climate. We're planning a deep retrofit that we'll tackle in phases. Our first priority is dealing with the existing flat roofs. We want to insulate, air, seal, and slope them before re-roofing. Oh, and there's currently no overhang, so we'd like to add overhangs to protect the walls that will retrofit by insulating on the exterior at a later date. 
We need to replace the flat roof. It's currently modified by Tumen, and it's estimated to be 25 years old. There are scuppers cut at the back of the parapet, but the roof has no slope. In fact, it sags in the middle. So surprise, surprise, it doesn't drain. It doesn't not only drain, it ponds water, and it looks like it's, I don't know, what do y'all think? Uh, deep, right? It, it, it looks to be a significant amount of water. The flat roof assembly consists of the roof membrane over fiberboard, half-inch sheathing, 2 by 12 wet rafters with 4-inch thick craft face, fiberglass bats, and a drywall ceiling. Our energy models suggest we'll get about R12 from that buildup. The existing roof is vented. We don't want to disturb the ceiling inside because there's asbestos in the drywall compound. It would be pretty straightforward to add sloped insulation above the roof sheathing, but our challenge will be in fact that the flat roofs die into the sidewall of the glazed clear story. The sill of the windows is about 13 inches above the finished roof, limiting how much we can build up the assembly. I should note that the clear story windows are protected by 40 inch deep overhangs, and in the four winters we've lived in the house, we haven't seen any snow accumulate under the windows, so I'm not sure how important it is to have clearance below them. The way I see it, we have two retrofit options. Okay, one, leave the existing roof sheathing in place, install a self-adhered air barrier and temporary WRB over it, install graft slope, graphite, install sloped graphite infused EPS. Mm -hmm. It will be five and a half thick at the sidewall tapering to one and a half inches at the eave, install two by four rafters on top of the foam, to give us a 16 inch overhang and solid framing for future PV attachment. Fill in the rafter ca cavities with mineral wool, install sheathing and new flat roof membrane base and cap sheet. This option would do away with the venting and give us a hot roof with around R30 at the eave, uh, which is the minimum we need outboard the sheathing to avoid condensation and R50 at the sidewall. We'd have about five inches of clearance under the clear story windows. The upfront emissions with this approach would be about 1.3 T CO2 E. I don't even know what that means. Do you, Samantha? No. Okay. I'm looking at the, at the drawings. Um, so so uh, in summation here, we're going to put on uh, a new membrane roof, sloped insulation, uh, two by fours to support a future overhang and PV, and then fill the cavities with mineral wool. And obviously you couldn't do that in the order I just, uh, <clears throat> just sum summarized it, but mm -hmm. that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Plan two is to remove the sheathing and spray foam the existing rafter cavities uh, with two pound closed cell foam, reinstall the sheathing, install a self-adhered air barrier and temp temporary WRB, install the sloped graphite infused EPS over that, same thicknesses, and frame overhang ladders flush with the existing roof plane and apply them to the existing rafter rim, and install a new flat roof membrane. This would be a hot roof with a higher R value, uh, 50 to 70, with a reduced risk of condensation and more clearance under the clear story windows, around eight inches. But it would involve materials with a higher carbon footprint, plus we'd make it would make it a nightmare for someone who may want to replace the drywall in the future, as the whole ceiling would basically be glued together with spray foam. What would you do? Are we overlooking another brilliant solution? Could we put a bond break into the rafter cavities? to keep the spray foam from adhering to the drywall. Looking forward to your perspectives. Love the podcast. Keep up the great work. Thanks a million, Mark. Whoa. Now, okay. I, if you're asking, if your question is the, what is the CO2E, that's yeah. the carbon dioxide equivalent in tons of what the essentially greenhouse gas emissions or the upfront carbon emissions will be for this, this project. So the lower, the better, because that amount will contribute to general warming. Gotcha. These two numbers that he gives are not hugely far apart. The, the, I, the R values. They're not R values. They're CO two. Oh, I, okay. You're saying that, but between the two assemblies, this the the greenhouse gas emissions are relatively similar. I think so, though I don't want to speak out of turn. Spray foam does have higher higher emissions, higher carbon emissions, but both of them, like 1.3 tons versus five tons, neither of them are carbon sequestering, and neither of them are up to like the 20 ton ton mark. Um, but I'd I'd have to 
check that out in a, a graph because it's not measured in you know, meters cubed or anything like that. So I don't know if five is, is really a huge amount. I'm guessing it is. Um, I, I don't have a better solution. I think both of these assemblies are legit. Um, I, you know, I would definitely talk to a commercial roofer uh, about what they want to do because I think they have a lot of expertise that um, would be useful in this situation because what you amount, what this assembly amounts to is a commercial building. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have flat roofs abutting sidewalls and that's their clear story, which is a very similar assembly to many commercial buildings. You know, I don't feel, uh, like I'm an, an expert in this in any regard, except that I would say Diami has reminded me of epoxy roof materials for, uh, low slope roofs that allow fenestration to be very close to the roof deck. Uh, and these are commonly used in very expensive modern homes with, uh, you know, windows that go nearly from the floor or the rooftop deck to the ceiling or high up, right? And they're just really close to the to the roof. So that's a solution that they use for that kind of assembly. But I would talk to someone who's more knowledgeable than me. It also, you know, I, I was going to suggest the first option without looking at the two options, like build up on top of the roof and looking at the difference between the two options, it seems like the difference is a larger carbon footprint for the spray foam know, spray foam option and the difference of approximately three inches. And so, you know, I, I'm looking at a couple of photos and it's hard to tell exactly, but I might find that those three inches are not worth all of the negative cons that have been listed for the second option you know it would be it would be more difficult to replace the drywall in the future because the ceiling is going to be glued together with spray foam. i think if you could avoid that that's what i would do so there's a few things that i thought of i mean basically we're talking about sloping adding the adding a little bit more roof slope after you basically tear the plywood off and insulate underneath from the top side or building a whole new roof assembly above it with a bigger slope. Some things to consider, if you are going to build like right over the top, a whole new roof assembly, you gotta be sure, you know, that, cause you're adding a lot of weight up there and you're adding, you're doubling the weight of the roof itself and it's probably gonna be fine where it's built, but it, you know, what the bearing points are gonna be up against the wall on one side and the, and the, and the exterior, it should be fine, but it's something you should consider before you start adding a bunch of extra weight up there. To your point, Mark, is going to be a considerable snow load potential, right? So uh, this has to be built uh, to withstand that. And about regarding the snow, it's she uh, or he, he, right? He mentioned mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, right now there's not snow sitting up there up against the windows because, I, I mean, honestly, if there's very few windows, any kind of fenestration, windows or doors that are going to fare well with snow packed up against it for four months. And you made in and, and just changing that height, it kind of changes everything, the way the wind flows around. I mean, right now there might be nothing there, but if you change that the size of that space, who knows? I mean, the wind, uh, the way the wind blows around, it could fill that whole area, just pack it full of snow. You just don't know. And, and to begin with, he never, he never mentioned anything about leaking. And I didn't see the uh, pit, the picture, the photo, Patrick, of the actual water, but it sounds like there's not any leaking going on, correct? I got to assume that, Mark, because uh, the photo I saw, and I forgot, I guess I forgot to put it in the attachments, but uh, it looked like there was a pretty significant pond on one of these roof slopes, and, uh, you know, I would worry about that, but ponding water can be okay on membrane roofs, you know, they're, yeah. they're meant to be watertight, unlike right. shingles, which are just shedding, so. So it could be, I mean, it could be a... <laughs> more of a repair of what's existing almost than you know building a whole other roof assembly and if you do go the route with tearing up the plywood and spraying the, the cavities uh, with foam if you are worried about future you know remodelers pulling that drywall just throw some poly down in those you know in those cavities and spray over that i think it hurt nothing are you suggesting, Mark, that there would be a way to fix it and like introduce the most minimal slope, like a quarter? Yeah, if, I would probably go that route first. Just, I, I mean, it, it all depends on money too. I mean, and there's the, it, it's, it's the balance between the um, 
how you want it to perform, how much money you have, and the mm -hmm. environmental concerns that you mentioned. So it's kind of a balance, but for sure, we're working right get now it. on a on an article about a, a a roof that sloped just like that in Minnesota, where it's it's really snowy and how and how it's working um, with the scuppers as well. I learned what scuppers were for the first time via that article. <laughs> Thought those were only and, on boats. <laughs> and the other thing to consider is adding eaves. Yeah, it's always a good idea for any kind of, mm -hmm. you know, cladding. It's always going to add more protection. I built this house with very little eaves, and it's about the dumbest thing you could do. But it was the look I was looking. I mean, it's the look I wanted. And adding eaves might change the way that area of the house looks more than you think. So that's another thing to consider. I mean, it really might change a lot. Mark asked for another uh, magic bullet, and uh, I'm going to suggest move but <laughs> uh, the house is gorgeous uh, but mm -hmm. it also points out to the difficulties when homes are not built to the local vernacular um, there's a reason houses in different parts of the world look the way they do and um, you know it's cool to have something different but it's also a potential uh, obstacle right to simple assemblies well, and mid-century modern homes are notorious for looking really distinctive and performing really poorly. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gorgeous house. I, I think you all agree. It's really cool yeah. looking. Yeah, it is. I, I, I love it. And I and imagine that room just gets lit up, you know, with those windows on that, uh, on that one side there. That's yeah. I would say modern architects don't make it easy on roofers and builders. And I would say they should try <laughs> to do better on that. <laughs> yeah. Simple forms. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, here, comes one from Pete. Hello, FHB pod. Your favorite bearded, bearded interior designer here again from Caledonia, Ontario, Canada. Uh, it's spring again, and I pulled out our outdoor programmable water timer for the garden beds last week. Ours is the Orbit single outlet. It doesn't seem to matter which manufacturer you choose. Same concept, different colored hunk of plastic. I know the connections are outside, but we all know threaded plastic fittings are under constant water pressure is bad news. It doesn't ha matter how much Teflon tape you use. They always seem to leak. This got me wondering, is there any programmable indoor water valves or even electronic valve that I could plug into a timer that would be less susceptible to frost and way more reliable? I can split water lines outside after a frost-free slash air purge hose bib outside. Bonus points if you can find one that ties into PEX because I can't seem to find one. I've been binging on the podcast from the start. Thanks for keeping it up. I most certainly appreciate the information and wide range of feedback. Well, I do too, Pete. Thanks for writing in yourself. Um, so I wrote to my friend Mike Lombardi about this subject, and uh, I'm going to read what Mike wrote because there's a lot of guidance here for the notoriously frustrating hose bib connections that I think we all uh, can relate to uh, at one point or another. Uh, Patrick, I don't have a ton of experience with irrigation system valves, timers, controllers, etc. But I do know there are solid brass, programmable solenoid valves with NPT connections that could easily be fitted with PEX adapters. The poster mentioned Teflon tape, which is not needed for their hose bib companion nut connections. Companion nut connections, how about that? Uh, and in some cases can impede a successful mating attempt. There are millions of these types of connections that are a continuous pressure that don't leak. Think about your washing machine, for example. Uh, while the male thread on a hose bib is close to three quarter inch national pipe thread, it is not tapered or deep and has a different thread pitch than NPT. Garden hose thread is officially referred to as national hose, sometimes abbreviated as MHT, because that makes a lot of sense, and FHT for male and female, uh, we come across quite a few plastic leaking garden hose connections. Most often the leak is the result of a poor quality washer. I prefer a supple but firm flat rubber washer that will seal and push back as it makes up. Uh, many times hard plastic washers that come with devices don't seal well, especially under the influence of high water pressure or water hammer. Water quality or lack can also affect washer and companion nut integrity. Chemicals used to treat public water sometimes can erode and corrode. High concentrations of salt, chlorides, and chlorine can really affect non-brass metal fittings and nuts. Sometimes an irrigation timer valve will benefit from a water hammer arrestor installed somewhere upstream. This depends on the water source, water pressure, solenoid valve shutoff, frequency and timing, etc. There is so much plastic in this modern world, it has infiltrated every aspect of the building and the building trades, including maintenance, installation, and repair. Technology has helped plastic products improve in reliability and quality. 
ASCO Corp makes several types and sizes of brass body 120 volt solenoid valves that could be easily wired into series with a digital programmable timer for irrigation use. I hope this helps and thanks for staying in touch. So once again, uh, ASCO, uh, 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 Pete, anything to add to that, y'all? That was a pretty good answer. He covered all my, he covered all my, my suggestions. And the Teflon tape was probably, it might be the Teflon tape that's preventing it from working, for, right? Yeah. Yeah. From leaking. Yeah. It might be getting wadded up and getting in. And it, yeah. And then the washers and it's a good point about washing machines. Yeah. They last for years and years without ever leaking. So it's not the necessarily the hose bib style connection. That's the problem. It's, and admittedly, washers are indoors, which makes it an easier environment to uh, be true. watertight. And also, uh, you know, like the advice about the rubber washer versus the hard plastic one seems great. I've had yeah. great success with the red ones that you get at the hardware store. They come in a little yep. plastic bag and they work yep. fine. I've, got, I've always got some extras on hand. And checking the water pressure. In my house, I have one particular, like really towards the end of the line that man, it just seems way higher pressure than any of my other. So he might have something where that's just like unusually high water pressure there. That's, you know, messing things up. I will concede that the, um, you know, we have an outdoor sink for Carol's garden where, so she can wash us vegetables before they come into the house. And I have to replace the, uh, plastic, uh, cartridge that, you know, what amounts to the thing that controls the flow of water, every year because you cannot get all of the water out of it and it cracks. So maybe that's what's going on with Pete's um, uh, timer is that it's uh, failing from being outside in the cold temperatures. And maybe if you could bring it in, it would last longer. I don't know. Yeah. And just to be clear, we're talking about the ones that just hook up to garden hoses. We're not talking I think that's about, what he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. We're not talking about an irrigation system that has, that was installed by, you know, professional irrigation company where it's, you got the controller in the inside and you got the vacuum you know, bell thing on the outside. It seems like a um, question for the rest of the. And, and one to hook to, yeah, he and and your expert who who, who Mike who, Lombardi, plumber in Danbury. Yeah, well, he mentioned that yeah, you can find a hose if you just type hose bib to pex fitting, you'll find one. I think uh, if folks who are listening to the show have thoughts on this subject, please share them because I, you know, this might be something that's an easy fix. Uh, I'm guessing that the valves Mike are talking about are not inexpensive. I'm guessing hundreds based on what they look like. <laughs> but you well, only need a couple. Yeah, or one even, depending on how many irrigation uh, right. zones you have. How are we doing, Jeff, on time? We got time for another one yeah we got plenty of time okay uh this comes from will hey folks i wanted to follow up on my email which was addressed sort of on a recent podcast <laughs> Ooh, that's a shame <laughs> <laughs> i live outside of boston in zone five again i'm trying to figure out the best way to replace my awful 1970s aluminum single pane replacements with storms in a 1920s bungalow the age-old saying in building science, windows are last may be true for many houses, but I've done a lot of air sealing and fully electrified and all the leakiest parts of the, uh, sealed all the leakiest parts of the envelope. The big problem is the windows. They're terribly uncomfortable. And don't tell me I don't need to replace them. There are, there are incentives to replace single panes with triple. So which triple pane window should I choose? And who can do the replacement? It's possible to f is it possible to find good people to do proper work these days who actually read fine home building and understand flashing, et cetera? There should be, I subscribe to FHB certificate so you know when you're getting quality folks. Um, Manny Silva, and I don't know if I'm supposed to reveal this because I don't know if legal is okayed it, but Manny Silva has a fine home building logo on his van, which delights me uh, to show that, you know, he's contributed to the brand. And uh, I did uh, not know that. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so now, since you did that, legal is going to make him take it down to my. Yeah, he's going to get a phone waiting. call. I see some desist. <laughs> Legal's not listening to the podcast. We can say whatever we want. <laughs> I, what do we tell so, Will? Uh, triple paint. So he's in zone five. I wouldn't, I don't know why he jumped from single to triple. I would say that's not necessary. Um, triple paint. I think a lot of people think 
triple pane isn't going to be three times more efficient or three times more energy saving. And because the way the triple pane windows are put together, it's not like you can just take out the sash of a double pane assembly and just throw in a triple pane sash. It doesn't work that way because it's adding, there's space between those panes and it adds quite a bit. I mean, a triple pane sash is bigger and it needs a special, and window companies, they have these standard parts that go in all sorts of different products. And with when it comes to triple pane, they need special parts for what basically. If, Mark, what if Will is planning to do full window replacement? Like he's not uh, planning on a replacement window, but he wants to tear out his windows yeah. completely and put in new units. No, I would still say, and I'm just saying the reason it's just, you're jumping up in price considerably with triple pane and you're not getting what you, th in zone five, you're not going to get that money back probably ever. If you're in zone eight, yeah, triple pane all the way. Absolutely. But he, and that was the other thing. He doesn't really say if he, if he's going to, you know, obviously the best time to, to do windows or the best way to do windows is to do it while you're replacing the siding. If you're, if you're, if you live in a really leaky house and you do a replacement window, which is great because now all those sash parts and the moving parts of the window are better, more efficient, but you've never addressed the space between the, you know, the case, you know, popping off that casing and realizing there's no insulation in there, you know, you're, there's a lot, there's a lot of heat loss and airflow coming through those. So I, the one thing with, to me, triple pane, unless you're in zone six or above, I don't know that I would recommend them. The one thing they really do actually do pretty well is a sound reduction. I've heard good things. A lot of people say they went from double to triple and the sound, you know, if you live on a busy street in the city, whatever, I've heard a lot of people say that made a huge difference. But and otherwise, lives you, think, in Boston. you know, like low E insulating yep. glass unit, that's yep. just a double pane is going to give He's not going to get in zone five, you're just triple pane unless you want the sound as well. Or you, you know, you're already starting out with this, you know, preposterously high, and you want to get the lowest numbers in your neighborhood, then that is great. But yeah, going from double to Going from single to double is going to be just a huge improvement. Yeah, I won't tell you you don't need new windows if you have single pane windows. No. No, no. <laughs> no, I won't say that either. I would agree that you need that, although I but want make to be sure, Yeah, to but make sure you do address the, you know, the area between, even if you still go with replacement, you know, double check that you have insulation and it, sometimes it's only popping off one piece of trim, you know, uh, and then looking behind. And if you see that it's insulated the way it should be, then you probably can assume that most of them are done right. If you pop it off and you see nothing, then, yeah, you should address that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to suggest that, Will, if you want insert replacement windows, that is you just want to replace the sash uh, and leave the trim and the frame there. Uh, Marvin and other manufacturers make very attractive, very sturdy, relatively easy to install insert replacement windows that have very good thermal performance and are easy to live with and will be way more comfortable because I'm guessing that is Will's primary complaint. Mm -hmm. If he's sitting next to these windows in January, it's going to be miserable. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Because you're yep, talking R1. Uh, even, you know. Maybe yeah. something a little bit more with that with the storm, but yeah. I think we might have told Will that windows are seldom um, going to pay for themselves, but sometimes you want new windows for other reasons, yeah. right? It's yeah. more no, than no, energy I, savings. I, I, yeah, my advice is more the triple versus there's no reason to go triple, but yeah, replace your double panes tomorrow. <laughs> single panes. Or single panes, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Replace your single panes tomorrow. Yes. Jeff, are you comfortable next to your windows in winter? Um, I am, yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's uh, a worthy upgrade to go to triple pane? Uh, well, the, the one thing that he mentioned in his letter is incentives. And he's in Massachusetts, and there are some significant incentives, and I wonder if mm -hmm. that is tied to triple pane. Mass save. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a good point. And it's there are point. there are some local manufacturers in New England that do reasonably priced triple pane, I believe. 
Yes, and for a lot more on the subject of Windows, I <laughs> attended a webinar last night with a number of window experts. Uh, Alex from Marvin, uh, Greg, who was a glazings researcher, uh, Matt Maines, a designer, and Josh Salinger, a builder, all weighed in on Windows, double, triple pane, uh, and considerations uh, that... We decided there was so much to talk about with regard to Windows that we need to have a second installment <laughs> of the Window webinar because we didn't even get to gas fills and and all you know uh, replacement windows weren't discussed. It occurred to me this morning in the context of this conversation. So it's a huge topic, uh, and there's also a podcast after show if folks are interested in Windows to to listen to. So. Can we talk about Windows on your house uh, in the after show, Mark? Sure. Well, I used to work at Marvin, so yeah, I know. I'm, yeah, they make great products. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Did you put ultimate double hungs in your house? Even with my very generous employee discount, <laughs> I still did not. <laughs> I got to say, those are absolutely my favorite double hung windows. They are just built like tanks and beautiful. And the tilt mechanism yeah. uh, is amazing. Yeah. Yep. Nope. They're, they're, it, they're like furniture, basically. It's yeah. like you almost got to consider them like an heirloom piece of furniture. They really are beautiful. Well, I look forward to talking about your house more in the after show, Mark. I, I have Let's so many it. questions. And uh, it's interesting that so many folks with uh, ties to fine home building end up building their own house. And I can't wait to learn what surprised you or <laughs> challenged you. So um, stay tuned for money that, Money and time. So, I guarantee that we have money <laughs> and time. All in, uh, we all agree that that's what was the biggest surprise. <laughs> yeah. You picked the absolute worst time, I would say, in recent memory to start building a house. Am I right? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> uh, happy to help. Um, so, folks, please continue with your uh, questions and, and feedback. I love hearing from you. We all do and appreciate your support of the brand. Uh, stay tuned for the All Access show. If you're not a member of Fine Home Building All Access, I hope you'll consider it. Uh, it helps us keep the lights on, and I think it's going to be a pretty good after show today. So I hope you'll tune in. Any final words, team? No, it's nice to be back. Yar <laughs> City. <laughs> oh, man, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. I just can't even talk. Thanks to Mark, Samantha, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Hope to see you at the Northeast Building Science Symposium June 20 and 21 at Two Roads Brewing. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>